AI in Action is brought to you by Aulus International, covering your business's staffing, consulting, and networking needs. Our host brings you the leading minds in AI, sharing their story, their success, and their advice. Focusing on fast-tracking you to the top, AI in Action cuts through the hype to help you kickstart your data science career. To listen to the latest AI in Action podcast, head over to www.aldus.com forward slash podcast, or subscribe via iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Podcasts. You're listening to AI in Action. I'm your host, JP Valentine. Our guest today is Jeremy Box. Jeremy is the head of alternative data at Essential. Jeremy, welcome to the show. JP, thanks so much for having me. Delighted to be here. It's our pleasure. Jeremy, let's start with uh, some background of yourself, how you first got involved in technology, uh, some of the roles that you've held along the way, leading us up to your current position here. Yeah, sure. So um, I've been in and around technology, data, and capital markets uh, for the last 20 or so years. My entry into this world, um, I was a mechanical engineering student uh, in undergrad. My older brother actually was at Anderson Consulting, and uh, he seemed to love it so much that uh, when it came time to recruit in 99, as Internet 1.0 was booming, um, I worked uh, what is now at Accenture, uh, Anderson Consulting, for several years. It was a good view for me to understand all the business processes, technology, in and around ERP and big data practices. I worked on utilities and resources clients. And it was actually an interesting time because as the commercials were changing around how you can sell and serve electricity uh, in Texas, I got the chance to uh, help build a CRM and actually treat um, clients uh, and customers of the electric service as, uh, as, as customers, not just you know somebody that gets gets. Uh, gets uh, electricity. So that was actually a pretty interesting foray. And then um, after being there for a few years, Anderson became Accenture and uh, became much more of a a very large technology software company. I I started to itch a little bit to try something new. I was raised in Texas. I I had watched Wall Street, the movie, probably one too many times and was itching somehow to get my way to New York. Ended up uh, going to get my MBA at the University of Virginia thought about doing entrepreneurship and technology and, and a, bunch, a bunch of different other areas, but uh, I, I kept coming back to every investment banker I met, really, <laughs> maybe they're great salespeople, convinced me that um, being on Wall Street would be the best learning tool for me and teach me the most about business. So ended up uh, spending several years, uh, about eight uh, in investment banking, primarily at JP Morgan and Citigroup, um, doing primarily um, M&A, some LBOs along the way for large industrials companies. And what was interesting on the twist on that is that most of the industrials companies have an underserved unit, something like, let's say, for example, GE, we probably pitch them shedding their light bulbs business, you know, once a year, every year until, well, 20 years later, they've actually done it. But as you think about the businesses they wanted to get in, they were all about technology and sensors and being more close to um sort of the metal of technology. So I, that recurring theme kept coming back in my life. So in the early 2010s, um, I was thinking about, do I want to be a banker for the rest of my life or do I want to try to translate technology and capital markets together in some way? And was fortunate that a few of my friends also had this idea. And I ended up spending a few years at uh, Ace, Ace Portal was a, a capital markets exchange for private placements uh, that we created. Uh, a few of us, uh, you know, ended up uh, selling that to the New York Stock Exchange and a fund of funds. So my chance to get into tech and capital markets um, was was an exciting one. Ended up doing some angel investing and um, looking at some other businesses. Ended up finding out that you know data as a topic, particularly on Wall Street, um, was was becoming more interesting. Alternative data was a new um, sort of foundational layer for for new information. Um, ended up being a chief revenue officer at a company called Estimize, which was crowdsourcing estimates. Um, you know, equity research is a is a business that tends to follow corporates pretty well and tends to frame you know the future forecast of a corporate more or less like the company wants it but if you look at retail and trading there's a lot of different views on on equity research where if you think about corporate access you you can't really take a tough view on a company so if you get the wisdom of crowds involved you might get a better and more precise estimate Um, so long story short my first uh, chance to do alternative data i found just incredibly fascinating i mean the way information flows into hedge funds to um, sort of invest and institutional investors invest in companies uh, is tra- changing dramatically. So I realized alt-, alt data was what I wanted to do for the next foreseeable plank of my life and um, w- was uh, interested in 
learning as much as I could. So when I went to Bloomberg Enterprise, I asked if I could do something in alternative data, ended up spending almost three years there building out the alternative data platform and strategy there, um, partnering with uh, many different interesting vendors uh, to get in front of banks and hedge funds that are using alternative data. So a long one way of saying, I wouldn't necessarily have geared my life in this way if I were 18 and you asked me what I do with my life, but sometimes twists and turns kind of get you to where you are. So now um, I'm at Essential. I've been there since January. One of the most interesting companies that I turned up when I was at Bloomberg, we are a consumer analytics and insights business that helps uh, many of the best uh, consumer goods companies in the world understand product, price, promotion, marketplace design. Um, you know, let's say, for example, P&G is going to have a new diaper line and they're going to put it on Amazon. How do you price it? How do you bundle it? How do you make sure you're well-ranked and and uh, that the launch is successful. That's the type of stuff Essential does. I run a division that sells a lot of intelligence and data as a service, primarily to hedge funds. Thank you for that. Um, great to hear the, the, the overview and some, some key moments in time where you assess the direction you wanted to go um, and how that's led to, to where you are now. I, I think it's, it's quite refreshing to hear that certain moments that generate ideas for career change and, and you acted on it and now here you are landing exactly where you plan to be. So that's, that's, that's always a cool story. Um, so focusing on your current role now, head of alt data, um, can you give us some insight into some of the various use cases? You, you touched on it briefly in, in the introduction of who, who the organization is, but you and I have spent um, some time speaking previously just about the impact that Essential can have and, and where they're positioned in the marketplace, very much the elite. And, and while they may not be as big a household name as some other firms, I'd love to have you just summarize again the, the types of use cases that you guys are helping clients uh, work on. Yeah, look, absolutely. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm I relatively new to the consumer world. I have spent time in industrials and utilities and some of the more uh, sort of brutish secular uh, industries. So coming into consumer, I, I just find fascinating. And, uh, you know, particularly joining at a time around COVID, you find out pretty quickly the difference between consumer discretionary and consumer staple. So I'm getting a fresh look at what happens with aligning macro and micro and just how much goes into I would say corporate planning for our corporate as well as um, you know the the investors that that follow these companies. So we 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 have a practice that really spans the industry. So whether you're talking about department stores or you know fashion online, um, apparel is the unit I spend a lot of time in uh, under our brand WGSN. Um, that's where I spend a lot of my time. But we we have clients around the world, and we're known for a lot of different things. So we. We host Can Lion, which is a big industry event. Um, we've also got, we happen to own Money 2020, which is where a lot of people in fintech uh, find you know, a very interesting focus. So we bring together a lot of creatives and thought leaders in our various uh, industries to help really think through what is the future of consumer? What do you need um, if, if you're a consumer company to really be ahead of a lot of this. So for a, a Burberry, you know, how much uh, inventory do you need in the store vis-a-vis -vis online? How do, you, how do you get into the right wholesalers to hold your brand, to hold your price, but not get stuck with li you know, inventory that you need to liquidate later? These are the types of use cases that our company does as a practical matter. And then I was fortunate enough to come in to run our financial services division. So we actually have uh, a group of, of around five or so that are focused on sales and marketing of our data into financial services, but we get the benefit of being a 2,000 person company. So it's a, it's a very unique space. So we have hedge fund clients and, and equity research banking clients. I can't name any of them by name, but I can tell you that consider us the now cast for these businesses. So if on a given day you're looking at a large position in, let's say, um, Michael Kors is a holding company. Um, it's Capri Holdings uh, is the ticker. Um, they own Michael Kors, uh, Versace, and Jimmy Choo. So if you're looking at that company and you're trying to think through, are people ever going to wear fancy $1,000 shoes? When does the world come back? How are you know, the, the trends in belts and suits 
evolving, these are the types of things that funds um, really can benefit from working with us where they understand the, the detail of the inventory, the availability, how many wholesalers is a, is a Michael Kors using. So these are the types of use cases that a fund would come to us for. So it's really, it's almost what you would classically call data exhaust. We are the data exhaust of a much larger company that's being shaped and translated into something useful for our financial services clients. So when you're dealing with potential clients who want to access your 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 platform, your your services, and, and really get the maximum ROI, how much of what you do is taking them on a journey and educating them on how to to maximize the data versus handing over the sets, building pipelines, and and letting them customize what they need? JP, that's a fantastic question. Well, what's interesting for us is particularly with the funds, they all have people in-house that are what's called, in my mind, data translators. So they've got a mix of usually a quant and a systematic, somebody that understands statistics, and then they're paired up with a fundamental investor that knows the industry really well. Sometimes you'll hear the word quantumental used for this uh, kind of a, a functionality. So I would, I would almost tell you that Funds come to us knowing generally what they need. And in our case, it's average selling prices, number of uh, products in a category, um, market share. Those are the types of things they know they want. But I would tell you that we have a great head of data science and you know myself having been a practitioner as a banker, we oftentimes will explain correlations between skew counts, pricing, how does that influence revenue and gross margin to help them understand and visualize how they might use our data. But at the end of the day, I think the best uh, keynote that I can tell you is that our renewal rate tends to be 100%, if not more. People are wanting more and more data as a service, more of our advisory, and more of what we do. So I would almost tell you there's a little bit of a missionary sale sometimes up front with helping somebody visualize how they could use our data. But at the end of the day, once the uh, contract is signed, um, we do do some support in general industry trends, but for the most part, clients seem to know what they want. Um, one of the interesting aspects of this, I would say, is people look at quote-unquote alternative data as unique data that's not really priced into the market. I can definitely tell you the more and more people starting to use our data, the more it becomes a reference data point where it's an industry data point that's well understood. So as an example, companies that have a really good mix of in-store and online presence, it's a multi-channel business. So when you look at it as an investor to say, well, you know, we know what the same store sales are, or we, you know, we bought access to the number of people that walked into the store based on mobile phone activity. That's one piece of the puzzle, but you have to merge both of those online and offline worlds. So I think we are uniquely um, positioned in many ways to help most of the um, investors understand the digital economy. And that's really where we're sort of have the best expertise. But I think marrying those is really how you understand the now cast of how a company is doing. It's got to be refreshing to, to work with clients who at the inception understand the value of the data and there's not as big a bridge to, to cover when you know when you talk to organizations internally where you've got the tech team and the data team trying to communicate with front office and non-technical staff on the the benefits where with your client base they're coming to you already known in advance how valuable your your data sets are um so now focusing on your your team and the data science behind your products i'd love to to have you talk us through what it's involved with, with getting the product to market from data science, machine learning, deep learning, and all of the different factors which allow you guys to, to pull together all of this external market data and, and make it available to your clients. You know, it's really um, a, a labor of different pieces. So if you look at uh, most of our data sets, you know, of course, they are publicly discoverable. So monitoring a public website, uh, particularly an online shopping website, to understand every single SKU offered, every product and how it moves on a day to day basis. Is the pricing dynamic? Is it available? What are the average selling prices by category? It's a pretty significant lift. So I would say the skill set tends to be the technology to understand how to crawl and do things in a legally compliant and appropriate way. So that's what I would call data collection. It starts with collecting the data. Then the next layer is the ontology and skill set to link and uh, basically tab all of this into our, our internal knowledge graph. So there is a lot of mechanical turking involved when you start doing these businesses. But what you end up doing is getting a good mix of 
semi-supervised learning where you have a machine start to interpret where are the data points, how quickly do they connect, how do you label them, what categories are they in. So there is definitely a machine learning aspect to that component. And then once you have all that data, parking it into a data lake that's easily accessible with joined tables across all of our data sets um, is critical. And then I would say when we deliver data, it's usually in the form of an API and then our clients put that into their data lake and then link it to usually stock tickers, but they have to take our data and link it into something useful for them for market factors and analysis and precision of uh, decision making. So I, I think a lot of times the uh, dimensionality of all of this is really critical. One of the most interesting parts of consumer is that there's the macro and the micro part of it. So Testing a hypothesis of our clients, um, they might ask us something like, you know, above the keyboard is clearly working because people are stuck at home. People are buying dress shirts. What about pants? When are people buying pants? Like these are the types of questions that we need to try to answer. So for us, it's really taking this hypothesis, um, scouring through our own data, doing a lot of search, and then taking the history and creating some prediction models um, to help our clients understand these types of trends. So a lot of different uh, elements come into this. So data collection, data cataloging, um, linking it back to history, joining it to our other data sets, and then trying to find the right prediction models and remo reducing dimensionality. And one of the things I know you're, a lot of the good people that have been on your podcast talk about is avoiding overfitting, because it'd be very easy for us to take a thesis and run with that thesis and backfit the data to make it work. But we need to be very careful to not have survivorship bias and, and many other types of biases. So a lot of, lot of smart people that understand stats and technology and the industry kind of put all of this together into a bow and turn that into data as a service. So I, I, I love it. I, I, I clearly, I'm pretty passionate about it. I think there's so many elements that go into doing this right. Yeah. And, and I, that was my very next question. Look, you've, you've had a, a career path, which has given you access to, you know, some of the most well-known organizations globally, um, you know, innovating roles, roles that are the first time it's been created in an organization and then startups, you know, building your own startups and, and successfully selling them with your current position. What do you love most about your, your current role and, and the direction of, of the, the alt alt data space? I think it's marrying a few different capabilities. So when you're a startup, you're really looking for that product market fit and hoping you can keep the lights on while you're marketing it at scale and getting unit economics, right. And, hiring the right people and keeping capital in the door. I, I've loved starting a few companies and I'll admit a few of them as they failed. Uh, it's a labor of love. They're, they're very hard. You need all things working at the same time. So I love the idea of kind of the startup founder mentality that I've, I've been able to learn over the years and marrying that up with a, a, a tier one class A type of organization where I know that I'm going to have the resources and support that I need. I know I'll be able to recruit the right people. I know I'll have the time to find the product market fit. So I think I hate to use the word entrepreneur, but I do like marrying the classic components of the strength of a well-known, you know, well, well-regarded organization with the, the capabilities of a smaller, strong team where, you know, there is very limited bureaucracy. It's a very flat infrastructure for us. Um, so those are the, the types of pieces that really work for me. Now, when it comes down to getting right to where the clients are and meeting them in the middle, um, I really love that. I mean, I'm really a product person, even though I'm the head of our group and I do a lot of selling. Uh, at the end of the day, my favorite part is getting into the metal and understanding exactly how things are used and how can we make them better. And if we need to collect new data or reshape the data, um, that, that's really what's fun for me. So understanding the industry domain, understanding the technology, understanding the art of the possible, but marrying that with the reasonable. These are all the types of things I like to do. And then having said that, as, as somebody that started companies before, the hardest part is not falling into a consulting or advising role where you're, you're really good for one or two clients and you get distracted. I think building a symmetric view on the industry and building for you know, everybody to allow for massive scale in the future, that's you know, another thing that you need to really keep a lens on. So being solutions oriented, but building something sustainable and repeatable as well. So on the topic of, of building something, um, you've, you've joined uh, beginning of this year, you're, you're six months into this new venture. Um, how do you see the next 12 to 24 months going for your group and what opportunities can we expect to see as you guys continue to, to build and, and be uh, successful? 
I, I think it's, um, we've got product market fit now in apparel and fashion. You know, our WGSN subsidiary has uh, some really great businesses underneath it. So the 70% of our clients and revenue right now is really in apparel and fashion. I think what, what we'll see over the next 12 to 18 months is opening up our capabilities more broadly across categories. So we have a few new clients now looking at home improvement as one category. And then the other one I'd say was particularly interesting around COVID was looking at the uh, grocery stores and retailers that have food and other staples as part of their service. So I think what you'll see from us is taking the expertise across essential and getting those into different categories. So we've already proven that we have really good uh, understanding of fashion and apparel and bridging that into financial services. The next two home improvement and uh, I would say the retailers and grocery have, have been good. And now we need to keep expanding that forward because each one has its own significant dynamics and attributes. Some are more uh, winner take all. Some are a little bit more emergent. So whether you're talking about, you know, are we talking about healthcare and pharma and band-aids? Are we talking about, um, you know, how many bricks and logs are getting sold um, point of sale and, and hammers in a certain zip code in California by Home Depot. So I, I think it's getting deeper into every category. And then the other part I'd say is globality. So we acquired a, a really exciting business, about 150 people out of China, business called Yimian. They're really adept at uh, scanning the internet and doing a lot of the web interpolation that I was talking about that we already had resonant, but now we've really tripled that capability. So working more with my Chinese colleagues, both on their technology capabilities, but also um, a lot of our US-based clients are interested in JD and Tmall and Pingdudu and some of the social marketplaces that are developing there. So taking a lot of that expertise industry-wise and tech-wise, expanding that into what we do um, is another exciting component. Um, the world is changing, you know, as we think about online department stores, retailers, you're seeing a lot of merging. Um, one of my friends calls this the Walmazon effect. Walmazon, <laughs> Walmazon is really Walmart and Amazon taking share from the middle. I think you're seeing a, a big hollowing out of the middle, of course, based on scale and capabilities and operating leverage. So how do we understand how quickly the middle market is getting shredded um, while we see smaller companies that are really boutique-y um, still hanging in there, but we're seeing a lot of scale hollowing out the middle. So um, long story short, globality, um, getting our tech, tech uh, you know, chops improved every day, um, as well as opening other industry categories for our clients. Great insight. And, and I think that the, the follow-up question to that would be for the people, there, there's going to be individuals listening to this now who have a, an interest and curiosity about alternative data uh, and your your name and title will, will capture their interest even more as they're listening to this. The, you know, I myself, I'm, I find myself even more curious and interested. For aspiring data scientists, machine learning engineers who are looking to, to move from, you know, internal uh, organizational data into the, the external alternative data world, what tips or pieces of advice could you offer them to help make that transition? Sure. I, I think it comes back to what is your curiosity? Are you interested in the content? Are you interested in the data and information? Or are you more interested in the software and tooling? So I would tell you that Amazon, Snowflake, some of the bigger technology companies are taking a, a deep interest in developing these data marketplaces. Then you have some of the content providers, uh, certainly Bloomberg, where I was, FactSet, S&P, um, they're getting into the game more from, from, the, from the financial data perspective and linking industry data to that. Um, those are areas that I think um, are helpful. So really, if somebody wants to get into this industry, which part of it excites them the most? Where does their skill set lie? I guess the Japanese term for this is ikigai, uh, right? Where you're sort of looking at what do I like? What does the industry need and what am I good at? And how do I apply all those factors? So if you're somebody that has a great background in statistics, maybe physics, understands the math really well, it probably comes into being at a hedge fund or looking at data sets to see what you can link together and what, what, it, what you can examine from those. If you're more of a software person, it's creating the right uh, software to ingest data, to link data, uh, you know, companies like Google obviously have um, significant lift in data starting from the ad tech side. So it, it, to me, it's almost where, where is the point of origin? Where is the point of interest? And how can you best leverage that? And for somebody that's more in the academic world right now, um, frankly, it's reaching out and having informationals. 
Um, I spend a lot of time on LinkedIn. Um, I've got about 30,000 connections now. Um, over the years, I just love to go to industry conferences and be around people that I can learn from. So I would say it starts with, um, you know, offering, um, offering for free work, frankly. You know, if there's a PhD student at Columbia that wants to email me and do a lot of work for us, I'm happy to teach you everything I know. The price is right. Um, so it never hurts to reach out and connect with industry leaders and frankly try to offer them um, some, some, of, some of your capabilities or just ask for insights. Uh, one of my favorite approaches that people approach me with is, what's your favorite book? Or you know, how can I learn more about XYZ? I've already read through XYZ. I, I think the best way to get started is just to get started. Um, if you wanna learn more about uh, you know, how to use data in finance, it starts with probably getting a CFA or like learning the mechanics of Wall Street and then getting into data. So a, a lot of different ways to attack it. It starts with your own curiosity and interest. Um, if anybody listening is interested, um, I'm, I'm happy to try to give you some guidance as the first place to start. Well, I think that's a, a, a great piece of advice to end on with, with some uh, actions, follow-up actions from myself included. So, um, Jeremy, this has been great. Um, really, really appreciate your time. It's been uh, very interesting to hear about not just your own journey, but your, your role with Essential and you know, the, the space of alternative data. And uh, yeah, we look forward to, to seeing what, what you guys are going to accomplish and uh, hopefully have you back on the podcast again in the near future to hear about how things are progressing. Oh, thank you so much, JP. I, I love what I do. So if I can draw more people into the orbit of alt data and using this new type of information uh, to provide more intelligence, um, I'm delighted to be helpful and hope to be back on. AI in Action is brought to you by Aldus International, covering your business's staffing, consulting, and networking needs. Aldus offer an exec search program. Aldus can help you discover how data science and AI can transform your company. With our unrivaled network of C-suite executives and senior AI professionals, we offer retained search services across the US and Europe. For more information, contact mark at aldus.com. Get the Aldus Advantage. Become a member of the Aldus community and enjoy some of the following. AI meetups. Once a month, our community gathers to listen to some of the leading experts in the world of data science and AI. Our speakers come from all over the world, including Dublin, Boston, and Frankfurt. We also have our AI mentors. Our experts will provide mentoring to all its members. And don't forget our AI on Action podcast. Each week, we have guests from all over the world talking us through their education, career, and more. Become an Aldus member and get the Aldus advantage. For more information and to sign up for our newsletter, log on to www.aldus.com. Dot com. That's www.aldus.com. Aldus International, empowering through AI.